Call Hat Radio. You call Hat Radio TV. Hello. You call Hat Radio TV. This is you call that radio. This is you call that radio TV. What a week it's been! Thanks to everyone who's been tuning in. Thanks to everyone who tuned in last night for uh, Jason Williamson of Sleaford Mods. If you didn't catch it, you can watch it again on our YouTube channel. Uh, it was it was good to get the crack with him. And uh, still to come this week, we've got later on tonight at seven o'clock. We've got Frenetic, an amazing drum and bass uh, jungle DJ. She's fantastic. So we've got her on at seven. On Saturday, we've got the secret listening party for Minerva Wakes, who you might know from the Twistettes or the Gyro Babies. She's made an incredible new kind of trip hop, dubstepy, weird witchy album that uh, she's going to let you see for the first time on Saturday, a week before it gets launched. So, uh, aye, busy week and um, busy week next week. But right now, it's an absolute honour to welcome today's guest. He made this film. He was a producer on this film um, about the life and death of Brian Jones. Uh, most of you will know him as Harpo Strange Love of Alabama 3 fame and he's just got such an interesting background with sculpturing and death masks and so much interesting stuff so hopefully we can go live and he can hear me just now. Nick, can you hear me okay? Yeah, can you hear me alright? Yeah man, sounds good, sounds good. Uh, hopefully my, my screen's shaking a bit less, it sounds like the washing machine's calmed down a wee bit. Uh, if, uh, uh, thanks very much Nick, for taking the time to speak to us and I mean, before we go into all the Alabama 3 stuff I, let's just, I just want to start with the, with the film since I've got that in my, in my background here um, just tell us about how long that was in the works for um, it took us about two years um, from the initial kind of idea um, thing was written quite quickly it was uh, what really took a lot of the time was tracking down various people for the interviews and trying to sin- uh, secure the syndication rights um, and track down footage that other people hadn't seen so yeah it was a- about two years amazing man and then with regards to the soundtrack I think you say you basically sort of made the soundtrack yourself rather than trying to get the copyright for certain things yeah, well, um, we wrote to ABCO um, to try to secure some of the Rolling Stones uh, material, and they basically just, you know, they completely ignored us. They wouldn't let us have any, anything at all. And uh, so we decided, um, you know, we just uh, concoct our own uh, soundtrack in the spirit of the thing. And um, we did a couple of tracks with myself and uh, Ray uh, from the, uh, <coughs> the Hypnotics. And uh, then I got hold of uh, Dick Taylor, who used to be the bass player of the Stones and uh, used to be in the band called The Pretty Things, uh, which uh, I, I played with for about a year and a half. And I got them on board uh, to do a couple of tunes to kind of give it that authentic kind of 60s thing. Um, and in fact, we actually cut a disc, uh, a soundtrack. We did a vinyl, uh, which sold pretty well, surprisingly. Amazing, man. It's a, it's a cracking soundtrack. The, the film I have about I'm going to watch tonight. I was supposed to watch it today, but there's just not been enough time, and I haven't seen it yet. I'm really you excited seen about it. Yet. it. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. I'm just being honest, man. I haven't seen it yet. I'm about. I, I've realised the thing is I've not really had television for the last year. I've just been busy doing this and not really. I don't really watch TV that much, or, or I have a TV set up, but I've got now TV now, and I just apparently I can just press watch now, and it will charge me instantly and I, there's no messing about so it, it's definitely getting watched tonight after the, the interviews today man so I'm excited to see it because there's a, there's a lot of the history I don't know obviously it's almost like when you watch a Rolling Stones documentary there's there's very little about the story of Brian Jones yeah well, well, well that's it I mean we was uh, myself and Danny Garcia who was the director and uh, co-writer um, on this with me um <clears throat> He was amazed, you know, it was him who brought it to my attention that there had been various documentaries on the Stones, but nothing uh, particular about Brian. And uh, he's kind of overlooked by the rest of the Stones. Obviously, you know, they they tend to skip over him or not kind of mention him that much. And uh, when we first started out, it it just meant to be um, just a basic kind of biopic sort of 
anything of him. But uh, as you'll see when you watch it tonight, um, it's not about the Stones. It, it's really purely about him, and it turns into a bit of a kind of a who done it murder mystery um, towards the end. And uh, I won't be the only person watching it tonight. I'm sure that there'll be a lot of you call that radio viewers who haven't seen it that will be watching it tonight for the first time. And how's the best way for people to do that? There is a DVD as well. Understand? There's, there, yeah, there's a DVD um, which you can get off off, off Amazon. Um, it's it's available on various platforms. You're probably better off just googling it. But it, you can stream it on various sites. It's uh, and it's just on. It's on. Well, what I found it last night. It's on Now TV. It's on Amazon and stuff like that. Or Amazon Prime. If you've got that, guys, go and check yeah. it out. And um, I'm, I'm buzzing to see it, man. I'm buzzing to see it. Uh, who's who have we got? Chin We've got Lewis in the house. We've got Johnny Sloan in the house. We've got Petra. And um, Lewis says she's been looking forward to this all day. As have I. As have I. Really appreciate you jumping on the show. Now, we had you on the show before um, for Jake's tribute, which was amazing to speak to you that night. But I was just to want to, to, today I want to focus on, we'll, we'll talk about Jake in a bit, but I, I wanted to really focus on, on your story because it's, it's, it's quite an, an interesting background you've got. Everything you've done from this movie right back to your sculptor work, your death masks. Uh, um, in your musical career, so if just to take it right back to the beginning, man, uh, when did you you start thinking about um, getting involved in music and the arts? Um, I, I got into music um, when I was in the navy. Actually, uh, there was a guy that just turned up on the on the ship in my mess one day, and uh, he was a bit of a rebel, a bit of a character, a guy called Joe Sharp. And uh, he was forever kind of writing songs and squirreling away himself in dark corners and playing a guitar. And um, he just kind of had something that I was uh, entranced by, really, I, I suppose. And we formed uh, we formed a band together um, on the ship. And we used to do little skits on the ship's TV every night um, until we got barred because we wrote a song slagging off uh, the officers. And uh, so we got part of the ship's TV. But subsequently, whenever we went into port, you know, we would try to find a boozer somewhere and, and do, a, uh, do an impromptu gig. And when I left the Navy, I went, uh, he he got thrown out of the Navy, actually, um, damaging various bits of, uh, of the ship, shall I say. And uh, he moved to Australia. And when I left the Navy, um, I followed him out there and we had a band out there uh, called like vices, and uh, it kind of it just continued from there, really. And what what is I mean, obviously you you do a bit of everything, man. Is it is it a where where do you what's your um, your first love? Are you obviously I've seen you doing percussion, uh, harmonica, vocals, and stuff like that. Have you what, what was your first love for playing music? Uh, can I just correct you there? I don't, I don't know where the percussion bit uh, came in. I mean, I did used to play percussion with a band um, called Octopus, a Britpop band that was in, in the 90s. But um, someone's put that up on Wikipedia, I think, on, on the Alabama 3. But um, I, let me set the record straight. I don't do any of the percussion on uh, on Alabama 3. I stay well clear of the beats. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, would the beats not thank you for it? I remember I started playing tambourine with Gyro Babies and I was just putting uh, myself and the rest of the band off when I tried that. And I tried playing synth as well and I was actually alright at, at playing a bit of synth. But, you know, I'm no Elton John, so I felt like it was kind of or Chris Martin or someone. So it was like, I really had to focus on the synth while I was doing the vocals. To try to do two at the same time was 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 quite difficult. Really had yeah, to focus on it. That. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Not 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 the best of skills. I could get through the set, but I suppose um, you know my band is mostly about me jumping about the stage, making an ass of myself. So looking really serious, try to, didn't really work out for me. So um, yeah, harmonica, man. Harmonica is a, a is an instrument I love as well, and I I remember. Uh, been quite uh, not. I felt like I was a natural at first because I had a sh I got one for my birthday and I remember almost instantly playing Happy Birthday, the Happy Birthday song like that. And I thought, oh, this is I found my hang. But then everything else I tried, I was rubbish at. You know what I mean? I'd, I'd like to know how you managed to play Happy Birthday because basically, there's uh, it, you've only got. Um... 
your major notes on there, and you need uh, you need a flat in there to play that properly. Unless uh, unless you well, didn't I think properly. I think properly is a bit of a push. <laughs> you know, passable. It was passable. It, it's very it, it's very satisfying. It, it's very easy to kind of get something out of um, you know quite quickly. I think, which is why people you know, it, and it's very portable as well. Um, I mean, that's really how I got, got into playing harmonica is just the fact you can just stick it in your pocket, you know, and, it, and it's with you all the time. And, uh, you know, fuck being a drummer, carrying all that shit about. <laughs> <laughs> I, seen, I seen a meme the other day that was quite funny. It was, uh, I'll, I'll try and bring up the meme um, to, to show you. It was, um, I'll find it here. But, you know, as the, you know, technically I'm a singer that doesn't play an instrument, so I don't, really I shouldn't be carrying that much but because I'm usually also the promoter of the show I'm usually there at the start setting up the back line and stuff but there you go the singer when you ask him to carry something to the van <laughs> <laughs> that's about right <laughs> usually usually a bit right uh, we've got uh, Pixie Madison's in the house hello Pixie um, Frank like uh, Frank says hey Nick I'm still alive but I want a death mask so that I can see what I look like when I'm dead um, okay, well, the, before you answer that question, what is a death mask, Nick, for people who don't know? Um, well, a death mask is a, is a facsimile of, of somebody in death that is created by um, taking a mould off the dead person's face. And um, I, I use a, a compound called alginate, which people, if they've been to the dentist, you know, the, the stuff you bite into that moulds your teeth. I basically cover the head with that and um, make a mould, and from that mould I then pour in wax, which I can then re-sculpt, because obviously when uh, when someone's dead, they're laying down, and uh, they've generally been dead for about a week or two weeks before I get to them, so a lot of their features would have, would have sagged to a certain degree. Um, so I cast it in wax so I can correct all of that and, uh, and get them looking to the point where um, they would have been uh, when they died, as opposed to when they've been laying on a slab in a fridge for about a week or two. What's what's the history of death masks? Is this because obviously it's it's reasonably unusual in our culture, but is it is it a thing that happened in the past or in different cultures? Well, yeah, it, it was extremely popular um, in the Victorian times uh, when the death toll was particularly high. Um, a lot of a lot of people died young. And uh, the Victorians' way of kind of coping with that was, you know, they embraced death. You know, they, they saw it as a kind of a romantic, gothic, eternal sleep, if you like. And the death mask symbolised this um, more, more than anything, really. And it was common practice in those days. Anyone that could afford it would get a death mask made of a loved one. Um, you know, and they would hang them on a the wall. I mean, and it, this continued for about... 70, 80 years until um, the advent of photography. And then it became commonplace uh, for what they call memento mori, you know, and they would dress up with the head um, and take pictures of them. And uh, then the death mask became out of fashion. But historically, uh, the tradition of making death masks uh, goes back to about um, 8,000 years with the Chinchoro Indians of uh, Peru. So um, it, it's, it's a time old tradition that. It's gone out of fashion now, really. I suppose um, in the modern world, most people don't think too much about death. Um, it, it's something they'd not rather think about. Uh, and uh, so I, <laughs> there's not a lot of requirement for them now. I, I think I'm actually the, the only guy um, in England that still kind of that specialises in this old tradition. It's interesting that. Do you think it's because... And within general, longer lifespans means that we are further, we're kind of further away from death. So we can kind of sort of uh, protect, you know, we're sort of more comfortable in our mortality or we can kind of sort of like to pretend that we'll live forever kind of thing. Yeah, well, I, I, I think that was summed up quite well by um, Damien Hurst when he put the shark in formaldehyde in a tank called it uh, the physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living. And, uh, you know, you, you've got to think that our ancestors, particularly people that are more tuned into religious beliefs, 
I mean, you know, the concept of death was with them all the time. And as, as you say, and today people are living longer, us plastic surgery, you know, you, you, you can you can actually airbrush yourself for real. And uh, and that kind of attitude, death is what happens to other people, um, I, I think is becoming more prevalent now. And uh, I, I think people were very much, uh, in ter- you know, c- came to terms with their mortality and as such possibly um, enjoyed their time on Earth better and, and were certainly more equipped uh, for getting older and dying than I think people are today. That, that's for sure. We've got um, Jack Daniels says, Hi Nick, love from S- Swanage. Swanage, uh, Jack, Carla, Poppy and Ninja the Dog. How you doing, folks? Hello, Ninja the Dog. Uh, We've got Ali Grant in the house. Hello, Ali. Uh, Lindsay says, I saw Walter Scott's death mask at Abbotsford. Yeah, uh, but but that was another thing in the Victorian times. It was pretty much um, traditional for, you know, all of the writers, composers, celebrities of the day, you know, that they all, all had death masks made. In fact, this tradition of uh, buying the, or collecting death masks of famous people um, actually happened um, with Napoleon. He, he was the first kind of famous person um, whose death mask sold uh, thousands of copies. little interesting fact there. And obviously, uh, when the death mask he made for Jake and then the sort of statue, the memorial that went on tour as well at the Barrowlands, and it, it was uh, it was something special, man. And uh, I think everybody in Glasgow really appreciated that, that that Jake was just sort of was sort of literally watching over you as as he played that gig, and it was um, a phenomenal gig, man. Um, what, 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 what's your memories of that show? Uh, <laughs> memories. Now there's a thing. You know, I've got to be honest, Mark. I, I don't. I don't even remember doing a, an interview with you um, about Jake. I must have been. Uh, must have been in a bit of a mess then. But uh, not at all, man. Not at all. Not at all. Really? You, you t- yeah, man. I'll send. I'll send you a link uh, after, so you can watch after the show. And all you were in, yeah, you're in I, top I think, form. I think you better do when you when, when you said I'd done one before. I was scratching my head. Thinking, you know? <laughs> um, it was, it was it was a fantastic gig actually. I mean, no, normally, uh, you know, having done so many, it, 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 they do tend to kind of blur into one um, in memory. Uh, though those series of gigs were particularly uh, memory, uh, memorable, outstanding, particularly that one at the Barrowlands because um, because Jake was there. I mean, okay, we're all very much aware, um, you know, that he was no longer with us. Um, but it was the first time we'd got back together since he died to do a show. And the fact that there was so much video footage of him um, and the fact we'd got his voice from the original masters from uh, XO and Cold Arbor Lane. So he was there with us um, in, a, in a video format and an audio format. Um, the fact that we actually had him in a physical format as well made it um, very emotional. And, 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 and as you said, uh, it, the, the fact he was playing to... Um, kind of uh, his uh, home bodies, his homies, if you like. And um, it, yeah, it, it, was, it, it was very emotional and, and it was a magic moment. Uh, it really was as if, you know, and as if he was there with us. And uh, the stage was bouncing up and down and I'd put his head on a bit of a, a, a spring so that you know, you looked up at him, you could see that he <laughs> was in time with with the music. It, it was it was very surreal, actually, and um, it really did feel you know like the ancient Romans and the Greeks. They believed in animism, and uh, that you know you could house the spirit of something uh, in a facsimile of itself, and uh, and it was very easy to believe that somehow the spirit of Jake was uh, you know residing within that structure on stage with us. It was, um, you know, it was very memorable, uh, very, very, very emotional. I'm still a bit Absolutely. talking about it now. <laughs> well, we're just going to go, we're going to watch um, the the trailer for Rolling Stone, Life and Death of Brian Jones. This is what I've got here. Just to Excellent. convince anyone who's on the fence about 
about well, uh, do I want to watch or not? This this should hopefully make your mind up for you. And then well, we'll I think they'll be very and... surprised. Yeah, it will show you how dodgy the police were. Why were the Stones so out there? That really all focused on this guy, Brian Jones. You think of the Rolling Stones in the mid-60s, and you think of Brian Jones. You don't think of Mick Jagger. You certainly don't think of Keith Richards. Brian Jones is like, he's the perfect British rock star. He's the first English rock star with the most, perhaps the best look that ever been of, a, of any British rock star. He was a major player in the 1960s, fashion-wise, attitude-wise. He was the one who was the friend of John Lennon, the friend of Jimi Hendrix. Although they were five individuals, you sort of knew that he was the governor. His reputation wasn't very good. He wasn't interested in settling down to doing any work. Just wanted to party, 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 and make love to as many girls as he possibly could. A naughty boy, really. Was. He had an incredible insight into people, an almost devilish insight. You know, his drug taking was obvious. He was a, a, a victim and easy prey for, for the police and for the establishment. So sorry, sir, but here we have a warrant to search these premises for drugs. It was a plot to get rid of the Rolling Stones once and for all. And he rang me the evening, <laughs> sadly, that he died. Of course. It wasn't until years later that, that people started making conspiracy theories about his death, you know. It's wrong that a man's death could be ignored and the truth be hidden so the establishment could play politics with job culture on the back of that man's death. That's wrong. We are indeed powered by our patrons and we're live with Nick Reynolds just now. If you're watching this on Facebook or Twitter or Twitch, then you need to get the bus to YouTube. Um, I've put a wee link in the comments for you guys. If you're already on YouTube, then don't worry about it. You are in the right place. And uh, But yeah, we're live with Nick just now. We just watched a little trailer um, from Life and Death of a Rolling Stone, and uh, there's lots of comments coming in, Frank saying that he's really looking forward to seeing the film, um, yeah, we should all just watch it at 9 o'clock tonight at the same time, and uh, Frank's also saying, I found the Barrowland gig tough, it was great, but I had to go out twice because I got so emotional seeing the on-stage figure and video audio footage of Jake, I mean, I totally agree with that, it was emotional, um, but I think, I think that's what we've been, I suppose it, it's, um, that's part of the grieving process, is to kind of take face emotion head on and I suppose that's what's made the last year so tough with people losing people not just through COVID but just people losing people in general and not being able to to get together and have a have a drink and um, celebrate someone's life yeah I mean we, we I mean we certainly celebrated Jake because uh we, we we had uh his wake up at the Cluther uh, which was a boozer we always used to go to uh, in Scotland, in Glasgow, before the gigs, you know, the, the one that the helicopter uh, kind of came, came through the roof. So we was lucky in as, mu uh, in as much as that. Um, and I think about the people that have passed while this COVID bollocks has been going on, and, um, you know, only a handful of people have been allowed to go to uh, the funerals, going to send them off, so uh, at least in that respect. Uh, Jake had a great, 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 uh, great send off. Well, he had it's several, a, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a send off like no other from the funeral um, to the the, the Clitha and obviously to the Barrowlands gigs, and I'm sure the rest of the gigs as well. So, uh, absolutely. Um, Frank's asking if um, is there any films about death masks 
did you make one? There was a radio. There's a radio document. There's a BBC radio documentary. I think, isn't there? Um. Yeah. The the, the BBC uh, did a special um, on me a couple of years ago on the radio. I think it was called uh, Undying Faces. And uh, and and BBC they've also done two mini. Um, which I think they're on YouTube, actually. I think one of them is called The Man Behind the Death Mask. Um, I forget the name of the other one. Um, I, I've done I've done a few for students and stuff like that. Um, and I've been, cause I, I also I lecture on the subject of death mask. So sort of over the years, it's been a little kind of back project um, that I would like to do a documentary um, on the history of death mask one day. Because as I said, it goes back 8,000 years. It's, it's kind of quite fascinating purely because of the type of people that you know that, that were done i mean once upon a time all the royal family in europe um they had their death masks made because it was traditional um that when the king died um he would lay in state for you know quite a time a couple of weeks as they went through all sorts of religious rites and stuff like that, and um, the body was on show. And obviously, in those days, they had a bit of uh, they had problems in preserving the corpses. And um, it became clear that the best alternative to do was actually to swap the body of the king for a wax effigy. Um, and in order to make it very, very realistic, they would actually, you know, this, they would do a death mask um, of the monarch, um, and then they would uh, recreate him in wax and try to make it look as uh, realistic as possible. And if you go to the Tower of London, um, they've actually still got quite a few of them there and also um, uh, Westminster Abbey. So that was like, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a topic that um, hasn't really um, been done. I think the History Channel did a four-hour special um, on death masks. Um, but it was a load of rubbish, to be quite honestly, and two of the masks that they were talking about were actually... Uh, were life masks, you know, they were cast from the person, but in life, not in death. Anyway, I've gone off on that's, a tangent there. <laughs> no, 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 that's good, man. Anita's actually got a good question on that point. Are the masks used by South American population when they celebrate the day of death? Uh, well, no. Is that a life mask? Uh, no, uh, well, no, in, 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 the, in the day of the dead, you know, it's basically, uh, it's skeletons, isn't it? Um, it, it different kind of thing and also there's a misconception like uh, everyone's familiar with you could argue it, the most famous death mask in the world is Tutankhamun's but that's not a death mask that's a funerary mask you know a, de a death mask is a representation an exact copy of a, a person in death whereas a funerary mask um, it, it is a representation of the person in life that is placed over um, the person's face and buried with them. Stephen McBride says, the Barrelins was special, had a bounce with Mark, met him with a bird going in search of mobile, then after party, bought loads of raffle tickets, still don't know if I won, ha <laughs> epic night. Um, Steve from Ellen Debut. Yes, yeah, Stephen, that, that was, um, the, it was after the Barrelins, it was, uh, it was uh, the, the after party, was uh, uh, it was a Mojo fundraiser at Ivory Black's, and th those nights are always legendary, the, whether they're at Carrollton Studios or River or the olden days, the Soundhouse. Do you remember the, the Soundhouse mojo parties? <laughs> it's a bit like they, a bit, bit like the 60s, they say, if you, if, if you remember it, you weren't there. <laughs> um, <laughs> What's that mean? Some, you, some of the names sound vaguely familiar. Barney's, <laughs> I, I remember, but... Only probably because I've done so many gigs with, with him. Is that, that's the studios, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and obviously, Barney, I... Barney usually, uh, well, you, you guys usually jump up when the Carrollton Jug Band are, are playing a song. And the first time that's... I seen that, that blew my mind. That's right, yeah. We, I, I think we kind of like in and outed with each other a, a few times. Um, but they've supported the acoustic band a few times. And uh, if I remember correctly, I think Barney was up there doing his stuff. Um, at, at Jake's Wake at the Cluther. Uh, yeah. I, I only know that because somebody sent me a video, of which I don't remember any of, with a very drunk me and a very, very drunk and emotional Larry on stage doing a version of some song that went on for about 20 fucking minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Robin's asking, have you ever been to Goa? 
And do you have a problem with geometric spandex? <laughs> spandex? What the fuck? Um, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, 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 I do everything that Jake tells me. And if he says, don't go to Goa, don't go to fucking Goa, mate. <laughs> Um, uh, Joe was uh, going to India last year, and there was a uh, the the weather report. She was supposed to be going to go, but the weather report said that there was going to be some sort of I don't know weather warning kind of thing. And as a result, she changed her entire plan and didn't go to Goa because uh, the the words of Jake were kind of ringing in her head there, like "Don't you go to Goa?" So she didn't go to Goa. She went somewhere else. She missed the bad weather, and she had a great time. Uh, we got Danny. Says Larry Love show band at the Cotier Theatre. A mojo gig was a special acoustic set. Oh, cheers. Any reason why? <laughs> Any particular reason why, Danny? Uh, we've got a question from um, Anita who's asking, What's your go to sound to chill to? If you just want to chill out. Um, oh. uh, it's very difficult actually because I. I, I... I'm quite eclectic. I go through phases where um, sometimes I don't have anything on at all. I don't, I don't listen to anything. Uh, other times I'll just have uh, old Chicago blues playing in the background um, constantly. Um, other times I might feel like putting on King Crimson. Uh, like, like, I don't... I very, very rarely actually... Uh, <coughs> Confession time. Very, very rarely listen uh, to Alabama Three for some reason. Uh, maybe if I've, I've got company. But I suppose, uh, yeah. If I was trying to answer the question succinctly, I would probably say blues. Um, yeah. Little Walker, uh, Muddy Waters, um, although you know that kind of stuff. Absolutely. I've got. I'm going to just. Well, since you don't listen to Alabama Three very much. Uh, I think I might just play some Alabama Three, and we, we were talking about the copyright robots. You think we think we were going to be okay? We think we'll be alright yeah, to play. We'll, we'll be okay. We'll be okay. I've said so, it's alright. <laughs> <laughs> for whatever that's worth, absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, do you remember the the gig from uh, Sydney? Oh my God! Uh, which is that the acoustic band or the main band? No, it's the main band. Um, yeah, vaguely, the, the stage was so overcrowded, I remember I had a, about the space of a postage stamp on top of a load of coiled cables to stand <laughs> on, and if I moved one bit, I'd have lost my balance and fell off the stage into the audience. I think that's the only reason I remember it. Um, uh, yeah, it, it was a, a bit of a hectic gig. I think that might have been the one that uh, Chopper Reed came to, uh, where Orlando um, you, always, you could smoke in those days and Orlando had a fag on stage which he tossed into the audience and it, to his horror he saw it land in Copper Reed's son hair <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell and you have heard before that you, you met Chopper after the show well no I was good mates with Chopper um, because I'd got in touch with him years previously um, because I wanted to do a cast of his head. I did his exhibition uh, in the late 90s called Cons to Icons, and it was exploring the paradox. It, it, was, at, it was at the time when uh, there was a bit of a sort of like a gangster chic phenomenon. You had Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels out, and um, fashion had turned back very retrograde to the kind of 60s um, suave, you know, gangster look suits and everything and so i did an exhibition called cons to icons which was exploring the paradox about how people um who basically had been um you know were basically villains that have been you know fated on the media you know vilified on the media on one hand and then fated on the celebrity circuit when they came out and all these guys were coming out of prison at that time writing books and some of them were being made into films. And um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a question. Is have you listened to any Chopper's music? 
Oh, sorry, Chopper. So how did I get to... No, I didn't know Chopper was a painter, but how did I get in touch with uh, with Chopper? So um, I did this exhibition of famous criminals, uh, and I wanted to add him to uh, to the collection. I got in touch with him, and I went out there, and I did a cast of his head. And, um, and then when I went back there to give him a copy, and uh, that, that's when the band met up with him. And uh, I, I think... I must have told you, um, you know, the, the story. Did I? I must have told you the story before with Jake and Chopper, didn't I? Feel, feel, feel free to tell it because people won't. People need to hear this story. <laughs> right. Um, so we had to meet Chopper. Uh, th- this is like the, f- the first time I met him. I was in a hotel and I was with Rock Freebase. Uh, we were in the bar, and uh, Chopper walked in and uh, came over and sat down with us and. Uh, he lit the cigarette and instantly the barmaid came over and said, excuse me, sir, um, but you're not allowed to smoke in here. Uh, to which Chopper turned around and said, uh, you know, OK, thanks. If I see anyone smoking, I'll let them know. Now, fuck off. <laughs> to, to which he turned around and went straight to the manager's office. And about two seconds later, you thought he right. I'm steaming out, you know, with full purpose, full strides until he suddenly realised um, that it was Chopper sat there and he did a quick 180 degree turn and, uh, and minced back to his office. And uh, anyway, fast, fast forward, in, we, 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 we've met Chopper for a photo opportunity and to do some press uh, with the band when I brought a copy of his head for him. And... Uh, in the process of him being interviewed by some newspaper, he's, he's actually on the telephone. He was asked something along the lines of, um, you know, you know, Alabama three, you're with the guys, what are you going to think of them? To which he kind of retorted, yeah, they seem a nice bunch of guys. Except there's one guy I can't understand. He sounds like Billy Bloody Connolly, you know. To which, which Jake pipes up, at least I don't sound like fucking Rolf Harris. And, uh, <laughs> It's one of those moments where you could have heard a bloody pin drop, you know, and uh, there, there was an inaudible gasp from everybody as we all looked around at Jake and Chopper froze, looked around at Jake, you know, and his face was very impassive and we're thinking, oh no, and then he cracked into a broad grin, you know, and uh, that was kind of quite a, a nice breaking moment. And, uh, <laughs> The thing about Chopper is he was so used to people being terrified of him. He actually loved it if someone had the balls <laughs> to kind of rib him a little bit. So from, from that moment on, we all took every opportunity that we could to take the piss out of him a little bit. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he was a big fan of the band as well. You know, for a few gigs, he came on stage and uh, he'd introduce us uh, along with the lines of uh, why all their fucking records are our kill <laughs> 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 And... Uh, yeah, sad, sad, sadly, he's, he's, uh, he passed on a few years ago, and uh, his wife got in touch with me and um, said that she's uh, writing a book, and uh, there's a chapter apparently about you know uh, him, and, him and Alabama three. So I'm on to seeing that. Amazing stuff. Well, let's go and watch a little bit of the the gig from Sydney. Um, it's one of my favourite uh, performances. Uh, live from Sydney, Alabama. Step one. You gotta consider yourself completely powerless under me. Step two. You figure that's about 18 inches of jelly because jam never fucking shook like that. Step three. Make a search in inventory of everything worthwhile in your mother's house. Step four. Inventory meticulously taken hand and all willingly over to me. Step five. Heaven divine, the big fella. I'm the real switch hitting thing. Get down on your knees. Humbly ask me to remove your what a loose jumper. And then humbly ask me to start doing my ornery butt plug thing. Well, my business complete. Sorry to disappoint, but I may be here. However, if I am, you might ready to become a lonely little reverend minister. Call yourself a fuck you want to, you know. Just making your way. Day by day, rolling that ever so easy amount of sissy for drop right off the mouth of hell again and 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 again
17, 18, 19, 20 hours a day just to bring something there to the ever deepening, ever winding trouble of the beautiful, magnanimous, wise, beautiful, look at my fucking hair, girls. Big hearted, all the way. Generous, all the way. But don't try to fuck everybody around. Just give Elvis his money like a good person should. And remember, my name is D-W-A-Y-N-E. <laughs> I ain't waiting for no taxi sitting in. I'm waiting for my man. Let me. But I tell you, he ain't standing at all in. He ain't standing crack no. But if I was, it wouldn't make me a bad person. If we got all enough of that stuff, we would get up. Where's your kid? Shoot up. I am fun. The fourth mansion. The asshole plane. Mm. I want to just shoot me up at the main line. Shoot me up. Straight behind the cheek, zip it ten times. Shoot me up. Give it to me five times a day. With a big fat round hypo. Shoot me up. The beat down the side. Shoot me up. One can run, one can never can hide. No, sir. Not from switching the D white love. I got a fat hypo for the love. Yo, man, just a mess in the air by the bad ass stuff. With the oh, I gotta love Jones for everybody in the room, I do too. See how the sweat is shaking, bodies aching, badly. Feel the feel of it no more. Check, 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 baby. Two stop, can't feel it. Stop, I'll take the news to me. Stop, read it. Hey, sit there. Don't be too old, I'm not a ring, you ain't your number You have a free phrase A follow to 792-L-O-P-E-L I want you to shoot me out Right on the main line Shoot me out Shoot me out I don't need any love I want to follow up 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 this what good living sounds like. Shoot me up, but you never been hurt. Shoot me up, but you ain't love. 
That radio and TV. We're live with Nick. Hold on, I've got a bit of an echo going. Hold on, I need to remove that from the show. Hello, 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 hello. Uh, I've just got one. I've got an echo going on me, man. Uh, absolutely love that performance. It's it's just one of my favourites, man. What an important Alabama band Alabama Three is to me and, and so many people. It's it, there's just something about the band that makes it everyone's favourite band. There's no in between. You either love Alabama Three. Or you've not heard of Alabama Three? Uh, your fans really love the music. Well, yeah, I mean that's what I, I, I mean. I wouldn't call us mainstream. I, I suppose we slipped into that odd pocket um, of being a cult band, um, which I've been told means um, you've got a lot of fans with no money. I don't know, <laughs> if you've got not, but uh, but we're lucky that we have actually got um, a, a very loyal fan base. If it wasn't for them, we would still be uh, um, going out every year and still knocking out an album at, um, every year. So it, in that respect, when you see how many bands have been more successful chart-wise um, that are no longer touring, um, you know, we owe that totally um, to our fans. And uh, there is something quite infectious about Alabama 3, I've got to say. I mean, when I first heard, um, first heard the band, I could I, I couldn't I couldn't work out what, what was going on because I hated country music and uh, it kind of twisted my melon this in, infusion of acid house um, with, with country uh, but I like the blues element in it and uh, but it but it, it definitely does grow on you and, and as Irving Welsh um, once said and, and, and wrote on uh, on the sleeve notes for one of our albums. I think it might have been Outlaw. Um, maybe it was Power and the Blood. I can't remember. But he said uh, it's the only band that he could dance to um, in the day hours um, without the help of any pharmaceuticals. You know, and th 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 there's something, um, it's not very true in that. It's just like, you know, my dad loved jazz and he liked blues because he said instantly, you know, you can't help but tap your foot to it. And I think Alabama 3 has definitely got that um, element to it. Well, plus it, it's quite an eclectic mix. You know, there's a little bit um, for everyone in there. You know, but on the other, other other hand, you could say we're a little bit. You know, to, to use that uh, much worn out phrase these days, like Marmite. You know, you either like us or you or you hate us. So I remember when we released um, the single "Hello, I'm Johnny Cash," and the enemy. <laughs> Reported, no, you're not referring to Larry Love. You're a fucking twat in a cowboy hat. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I, won't ended... drink, I won't drink to that. <laughs> it ended up being one of the one of the biggest hits of underground of all time. That tune, absolutely love it. I've just watched back in, in January. I took a, a week off from the show because I've just been doing too much stuff, and I, I decided rather than. You know, people recommend TV series, but I, I, it's got to be really good, man. I can't just watch mind them on TV. I have to really get into it. So rather than risk watching a new series, I watched Sopranos, which I hadn't watched for 10 years. And it was just amazing, man. What it was, It's just aged like a fine wine. And it's superb to hear uh, Alabama 3 at the start of every episode. Yeah, well, we, 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 we were lucky enough, uh, I think, Two years ago, um, they did the very first Sopranos con, you know, very similar to um, like Comic Con. They had about a hundred, over a hundred actors from the show um, over in uh, New Jersey um, in this huge kind of hangar type building. 
and um, you know, and they had the main stars there signing stuff and doing bits on stage, and they flew us out there um, to play a few times. And for us, you know, as far as we were concerned, um, all the guys in the show, they, they were the stars. And uh, it was quite surprising to see their reaction towards us. <laughs> they kind of treated us like we were the stars, you know. Yeah. And it's like, well, only by, by proxy or by, you know, <laughs> by accident that, you know, that, that we're attached to this uh, project at all. But it's given us a great cachet, you know, and, and uh, we're very grateful to that show because Obviously, that's given us a worldwide profile, and um, uh, <laughs> we've made the most of that bloody tune. That's for <laughs> sure. But uh, unfortunately, because of the COVID, they were planning. It was such a success. This uh, Sopranos con. They were planning to do them in every major capital where, uh, where we're in countries where this show has been a big success. Which meant uh, our touring roster had suddenly. Um, explanated by, by about fucking 400 percent you know and it's like wow we're going to be going to all these major cities uh all over the world but unfortunately uh covid put the mockers on that um for the time being um but i've got to be honest i was never a fan of the, of the series uh particularly uh really because I, I i'm, I'm I, I don't have the time to invest in, in something like that you know if I watch one episode, I would have to binge watch the entire bloody series. So uh, I, only used to watch, I only used to dive in and out of it occasionally. Yeah, and I suppose you can't. It's not the kind of show that you can do that because there's so sort of interrelated stories that you've got to watch it. I agree with that, man. Life's too short to watch too much television. But I, just because I had watched Sopranos growing up, it was good to kind of go back to it ten years later. And, um, you know, there's a lot of themes that obviously resonated a lot more as I've got a little bit more mature, inverted commas. Um, so many great actors and obviously Polly, who doesn't even seem to be acting. And it, w Was there any of the, the actors in particular that were good crack? Yeah, well, pa Paulie was right opposite us because we, we had a sign there um, as well, you know, where we were selling posters and, uh, and albums. Um, he, he was right opposite us. Um I've got to say, uh, I don't know why, um, he, he he was the only one that didn't look particularly happy to be there. Well, <laughs> um, we had a good crack with um, with uh, the guy who plays Junior. Um, he, he was very entertaining and an amazing singer. And uh, and, and the actor who played, um, who was the, the was it? Or something. It was a crazy guy with a ponytail in it. Um, the very oh, violent yes, yeah, guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Italian guy. Yeah, he, 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 he was good fun. I mean, like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of the series. Uh, I've got nothing against it. I just never invested in it that much. Um, I recognised a lot of the faces uh, there, but I, I, I couldn't put names. But, um, yeah, we, we, we all had a great time. And in fact, after each night, we uh, all went to the E Bada Bing as well. Um, which is kind of quite surreal, kind of being there um, with the actors that were there and, and uh, you know, and, and stuff like that. Oh, that's incredible, man. That's incredible. You can't buy that stuff. So, you, you, so do know that, you do know they're making a film at the moment. I do, man, and I'm hoping, I think it's a, I think it's a prequel, so I think they've got uh, uh, James Gandolfini's son to play uh, Tony in the, when he's 16 or something like that. And well, it's coming right. out in August. I'm really excited by it. Is it? Are they keeping the same theme song? I hope. Um, I can't. I, I can't. I can't say too much about that at the moment. All right. Well, uh, no comment. But move, yeah, no, we'll no, move no, on. no, no comment. All I'll say is fingers crossed. Ponytail was Furio, correct? Furio, Thank Nick you. Furio. That was it. Yeah, Furio is. Yeah, no, he, 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 he was cool. I liked him a lot. Yeah. Lou says, it was by watching The Sopranos that I discovered Alabama 3. I loved that song so much I needed to hear more. And The Sopranos had the most disappointing endings in history. Do you know what, Lou? Well, not in this show, because I think we've talked enough about Sopranos for now, but I will. I disagree with you. I thought it was a disappointing ending. And then the more you think about it and the more you look into it, it's actually an incredible ending. And it's also a spoiler alert, so we'll do that another time. Uh, it's, we've got some... Uh, uh, We've got some great clips of on YouTube of Jake and Drag when he used to be on West Heath Yard Channel 4 with Edwin Collins back in the day. 
Really? Where do I where do I see them? Because we're doing a um, there's a documentary being made um, on Alabama three at the moment. So uh, if anybody knows of uh, any footage and stuff like that that might have slipped under our radar, particularly concerning Jake, you know, please let me know or or, or anyone um, involved with Alabama three. We've we've got some never seen before footage of the time Jake joined Gyro Babies at a sold out Barrowlands. Send never it. Se- that, I'll send it, it over to the side if you if you want to use it, man. Absolutely. It's, at the time, it was uh, it wasn't we I wasn't privy to the the footage, but I've been since given it. So I'll, I'll send it over to you to see what you what you make of it. Um, we've got um, so yeah. Ed, tell Nick that Salvatore will send links. So you've got some links of that coming oh, to brilliant. you as well. Nice one, well. Sal. Uh, you, were, you, were, you you mentioned briefly your dad, man. Um, I, I, I was just it's an incredible story um, uh, about your dad as well. I mean, what was it like uh, sort of growing up around the the mythology of the Great Train Robbery? Uh, well, to, to be honest, it was a, a bit of an albatross around my neck, I guess. Um, there's always that uh, thing about of your dad makes his mark in the sand, you feel inclined uh, or obliged to do the same uh, in some way. And uh, there was, obviously, there was, <laughs> there was no way I was going to follow in his footsteps. And I <laughs> certainly wasn't prepared um, to lose a huge portion of my life and my liberty um, to achieve a goal. I mean, all in all, I think my dad must have spent... Um, 21 years behind bars, which well, he died when he was uh, coming up to 82 years old. So, you know, that's that's a quarter of your life locked up um, pursuing some fucking... <laughs> As my dad said, you know, the, the madness to do the kind of things that he did, the same kind of madness that drives somebody to climb the north face of the Eiger. Uh, and, uh, you know... That, that, that's not that, that's not really for me, but uh, I, I think with anybody who's who, who's got a, a sibling or a parent um, that has become um, a, a known media figure has some problems um, adjusting to it. Um, I mean, even today, I'm, I'm, I'm 59 now, and I'm still the son. <laughs> Bruce Reynolds, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, no. a t- it's a it's a it's a tough act to follow, which is why why I went uh, completely the opposite way. You know, that's how why I got into music and the arts. Um, I guess really. Well, I think it's it's very seen that you've done you've definitely made your own mark, and you you have in in an incredible way, and that's why everyone's tuned in. Most people are here for your sculpture, your art, and um, and the, the music of Alabama Three. Uh, there's a question Frank's asking: Is it true that you met and discussed with Benedict Cumberbatch the possibility of him playing the role of your dad in a film about him? Also, were some of your fellow band members quite rude about that possibility due to the disparity in height? I heard that one from Jake, and I'd like to check the veracity of some of his stories. Well, you know, yeah, well, that that, that is true, and I what that was true. Yeah, I did, I did have a. Um, a long chat with Benedict about it, and uh, and uh, he, he was really keen at the time. And uh, I, I was about to ask you, how the fuck do you know that? Uh, <laughs> until you mentioned Jake, and uh, of course, Jake, yes. Um, he's not very good at keeping, well, he wasn't very good at keeping. <laughs> um, it was Jake who said that. Jake actually said, fuck that, he's too short and his eyes are too close together like Prince Charles. <laughs> Um, you know, but uh, I, I just want to sell my dad's book. I don't give a fuck about shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> if Benedict wants to play my fucking dad, you know, do it. There, there, there was a time when the rights to my dad's book was actually bought by George Clooney. Um, at that time, he was looking to do a kind of major crime caper heist type film, and he bought the rights, um, various scripts. And uh, one of them was my dad's book, but he ended up doing Ocean's Eleven, which, uh, you know, I, I often, you know, wonder how that would have turned out if, it, if 
uh, you know, you'd, you'd have had him playing my dad. I think it might have been quite interesting, actually. I think it would have been more interesting than Ocean's Eleven. I think he, I think George Clooney blew it. I think he blew it. Uh, we got uh, uh, Frank says hey, I've got some band footage. All real player downloads as MP4s on a memory stick with loads of other music that that Jake gave me. Uh, how would I send that to you? Uh, Frank? Just send me a link and I'll I'll hook up to Nick. Uh, no problem. So anyone yeah, else? Yeah, you've got my email, haven't you, Mark? Yeah, man. If anyone doesn't know Nick personally, then just send it over to me and I'll forward it on. Uh, yeah, well, Patrick, they, or, they can, or they can send me stuff on Facebook, you know. Yeah, uh, it's Nick Reynolds on Facebook. Uh, Patrick Murray saying, I've got some clips of me and Jake backstage at the forum drinking poutine. I'll send them to you, Nick. How you doing, and, Patrick? And uh, Patrick also says, Alan McGee's footage of Jake and I waving a semi-automatic pistols. <laughs> no, excellent. <laughs> Joe Bone, uh, legendary Joe Bone says, footage of Jake with us is out there somewhere. Yeah, I think if you just look up uh, Joe Bone in the dark vibes, I think he was playing there. Joe, Joe correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but there was a couple of collaborations that Jake did with them as well. Um, and there was a... Uh, yeah, man, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the sculpting inside of things. Is is that is that how you if you're on tour with Alabama three is that is that your way to sort of is that the therapeutic way to relax and 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 get some sort of sanity back to yourself? Uh, oh, <laughs> I don't know about that or or, <laughs> or, or, or sanity. Um, I'm I'm just very uh, I'm a bit of a restless spirit and I just um, need to keep myself busy. Um, I, I guess you know. But that old adage, the devil will find work for idle hands to do. Um, so I, I just try to keep myself um, as active as I can. So I wouldn't say uh, art or sculpting is therapeutic in any way. It's like fucking whipping yourself to death, to be <laughs> quite honest. Um, you know, it, but it, 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 it's something I do. I mean, the, the death mask is something I fell into kind of accidentally and... Uh, I've got to be honest. These days, I don't particularly um, enjoy it because there's there's a lot of unhappiness and trauma involved uh, in, in the in the process and associated with them. Um, so, I, I'll, I'll you know I, I don't advertise that I do this as a service. If if somebody wants one and tracks me down, um, I'll do it. But um, there's 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 no therapy. Uh, making a, a, a dead person, you know, look good and you have a, a kind of a, a very strong sense of responsibility in in giving this very precious, valuable thing to someone that they're going to love and cherish and it's how they're going to remember their loved one. And uh, that actually does, without, you know, sounding too dramatic, actually to kind of take quite a bit out of me sometimes sometimes so there's no there's no therapy there other than the fact that um, I feel you know everything else I do in my life is entertainment so it kind of falls under the bracket of you know you, you, you could say it, it, it frivolous um, and maybe not particularly rewarding in the soul stakes whereas um, doing death masks um, to me, you know, I'm not religious in any way and I'm not really uh, spiritual in any way, but it fall into an odd, an odd, an odd category, uh, death masks. And for, for me, there is a kind of odd sense of spirituality or sensitivity and personality to do with these sculptures, even though it is just a facsimile of, of a dead person. Um, and I tend to treat them rather serious. So, f from you know, th there's there's the catharsis that I get from the enjoyment that the person gets when I give them something that is is so treasured to them. But uh, I certainly don't do it, don't do it to relax. But it's the one thing that I do in my life that I think is uh, is extremely worthy. Um, Very purposeful. I don't think Alabama Three is worthy, you know, but it's that, that's a load of fun, and um, I don't know. Well, I, I think, think I think there's. I, I can feel I'm doing something something that that is really worthwhile, you know, um, 
and the rest of the art I, do, I just do just to keep my keep my mind busy particularly the films i mean i've got a whole list of projects that i'm working on at the moment um, can you tell us a bit any of them just now yeah um we, we're i'm about 80 percent through a documentary um called the final curtain um sort of the holy grail of punk video lost video footage is um sid vicious at Max's Kansas City, he did three famous gigs uh, just before he died. And they um, various recordings have come out on bootlegs, but up till now there's been no video footage of any of those gigs. And, uh, we've managed to get hold of some. Uh, that's for me and Danny Garcia, the director that I worked with the last five years, um, did the Brian documentary with. And uh, we, we've nearly got that off the ground. We're just trying to find a, a broadcaster at the moment for that. Uh, we're also doing another one on the history of Max's Kansas City. And uh, we're also working on a uh, cartoon series, um, a, a kid's cartoon series that's being developed in Brazil at the moment. Plus, there's, a, there's an Alabama 3 documentary that, that I'm not involved with um, in as much as production-wise. Um, but that's an ongoing thing, and I've started uh, in two years. It'll be the 60th anniversary of the Great Train Robbery, and uh, I've started um, doing interviews with various people um, so that I can do a documentary um, on my dad in time for that. So, so on, on that front, you know, busy, busy. Well, you know, what else can you do? The pubs are shut. There's no. <laughs> Is uh, with regards to uh, with live gigs and stuff, or are you just holding off to wait and see when things sort of return to some sort of normality, or do you have anything in the book this year that you you hope will go ahead? Well, we had a whole we had a whole series of uh, acoustic gigs that have been booked and cancelled about three times um, as Boris keeps changing um, the legislation as far as COVID regs are concerned. Um, I believe. Uh, don't hold me to it, but I believe our management is planning a series of gigs at Cam in Brixton um, in July, um, quite possibly, uh, which you know I'm looking forward to because it, I think this is this is obviously the longest we've ever ever had. The, the last gig we did was February last year at the uh, um, at the in some place in Holborn. I think that was an acoustic band. So, um, yeah, there's a series of gigs coming up. Um, hopefully, there's a few um, festivals that are going ahead that we've been booked in for. And uh, we've got a new album coming out and there's a tour um, with the main band um, that's been booked for the beginning of next year. So we should get some dates filling in, um, hopefully, um, in the next month or so, I think um, you know, the, the news will be out about what what we're doing and stuff like that, um, which I'm <laughs> I'm really looking forward to. And I like the idea of doing a load of small gigs in London. We we, we did a um, a month of Sundays um, at World's End. Uh, no, it's at World's End. No, Underworld. Sorry, in uh, in Camden uh, years ago, and uh, you know that was great fun. I mean, it, it, it's you get a, you get a different vibe when you're playing in a in a smaller stage with um, with the main band, obviously, than than you do with the big band. The intimate gigs are a lot a lot more fun. So hopefully that that'll be announced uh, the July thing. And, uh, and well, fingers crossed for that, man. If if that's going that. ahead, I'm jumping on a train for that, man. I can't think of a better way. Well, it should be it should be it should be a, a, a lot of fun because obviously we'll be getting a load of our friends. And, other bands that we've been associated with um over the years you know that that, that will be coming up uh with us and stuff like that and uh you know as you know we used to do a lot of stuff in brixton and um but it, it'll it's be perfect good. Place that, that's, our, that's our home home base really so it'll be great if we if we can do like a, a week of gigs there with all the various acts that used to support us over the years uh, at brixton jam um so now i'm really looking forward to it Fingers crossed for that. 
Uh, I don't want to keep you much longer, Nick. I really appreciate your time. Just a couple of last comments to read out. We've got, uh, who was it, who was it that said, yeah, 147 fun, fun, fun said, looking well, Nick. Don't forget, give me a head when I'm dead. And uh, we've got uh, uh, Danny, who said, we were talking about that gig earlier on at Cotier's Theatre. He said the reason it was memorable was pure quality musicianship and Zuba played a storming gig that night as well. Um, we've got um, uh, Bali is a fun place to sit and write, mate, says uh, 147's fun fun. Frank says, sounds fab, those Brixton gigs in July. Yep, I'm, I'm up for that. Um, Patrick saying, I'm fine, Nick. Good to see you, brother, as always. And um, yes, okay. I think I think I think that's us uh, for just now, Nick. Um, good luck with all the projects you've got coming up. The Rolling Stone: Life and Death of Brian Jones is available online or on DVD just now. Go and support it. I'll be I'll be downloading it or streaming it tonight, hundred uh, percent. One four seven is John Logan, by the way. He's like he just wanted to add. Yeah, nice one, John. I I, I will come out of the barley when 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 I've got the time. <laughs> just don't go to Goa. Just don't go to Goa. Yeah, just don't go to Bali. <laughs> don't go to Goa. Uh, thanks to everyone who's tuned in tonight. We're uh, back at seven o'clock uh, on You Call That Radio with an amazing drum and bass uh, female jungle DJ called Frenetic. Really excited to chat to her at seven. And then on Saturday, we've got Minerva Wakes listening party. Uh, thank you very much for your time today, Nick. And uh, good luck with all the, the projects. And I'll hopefully see you in July because. Um, I can't think of anywhere better than to end lockdown with Brixton uh, with Alabama 3. Well, yeah, well, thank you, uh, Mark. And uh, oh, by the way, before I go, how was Jason last night? I missed it. It was good, man. It's, it's definitely worth watching. It's uh, it's on the YouTube channel. I'll send you a wee link to it. But yeah, man, it was great for him to, to, to have a chat with us. So it's good to follow. I didn't know how I was going to follow up one legend. So by you being here, it's one legend after another. So I appreciate both you and Jason uh, taking the time to speak to us on You Call That Radio. And I'm, also, I'm, we should... going to, I'm, I'm going to give him a ring in a minute, so I uh, <laughs> just thought I'd ask. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, no, no, it was great to chat with him. And um, I, and I'm off to my local tabernacle to sing since Cunt Chops 23. Um, thank you very much, mate. I'm all the best. And uh, hopefully July, fingers crossed, for Alabama 3 in fingers Brixton. Crossed, mate. Nice one. All the best, Mark. Be lucky. All the best, mate. Take it easy. All systems go. Ignition. What is that? Oh, shit. What is that? It's a trap. Who you fight? I have four doves in my backyard. I'm comfortable pumping those doves, man. <laughs> It's good that people are getting bummed up again because we've not had enough of that. We've not had enough of that. We've not had enough of that. This is a democracy when you call that radio. Three, two, one. Shoot. <laughs> 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 